Welcome everybody to the Lake Murray Church Easter Sunday service. Before we begin our time of worship, I'd like to share a verse with you. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 6. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for dying for our sins and proving that you conquered death by rising from the grave again. And we just want to lift up this time of praise and worship to you and gratitude for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ the Lord is risen chapter 16 verses 5 through 7 say and entering the tomb they saw a young man sitting on the right side dressed in a right a white robe and they were alarmed and he said to them do not be alarmed you seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified he has risen he is not here see the place where they laid him but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee there you will see him just as he told you
Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Beneath the weight of all our sin, you bow to none but heaven's will. No scheme of hell, no scoffer's crown, no burden great can hold you down in strength. You reign forever, let your church grow. is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Easter's a beautiful time of the year. We can celebrate so many things, and it's good to be able to celebrate the truth and really celebrate what Easter is all about. Let's open up in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for that miracle of your word, which is a miracle that we can hold in our hands, that you will put it in our hearts and open it to us and let new life rise up within us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we celebrate Easter, it's a beautiful thing that we can actually celebrate what it means if we really know what it means, not many people know what it means. And when I, it's amazing, when I was a little kid, you know, I loved Easter because of the candy, the candy. My grandma would send us a box and candy, we'd open it up and there'd be a $5 bill on top and buy more candy. And it's amazing. And I'm so amazing that I'm still able to function the way I am right now with all the candy I ate. But this world's candy is not always healthy, is it? It's the things that this world offers. But there, what is healthy is truth. You must know the truth. And the schooling that this world offers often lacks the truth that we need. Imagine being instructed by the creator of the universe. How true would that be? When a person really knows the true meaning of Easter, there's really there's nothing better on this face of this earth than what Easter stands for. I'm going to be sharing from the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, anyone who's been a believer over a year should know certain chapters of the Bible have themes. And 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection chapter. Everyone should know this chapter, but it's so long, 58 verses. We can't look at it all. I'm going to divide it up into three sections. I'm going to start out with the introduction, the first couple of verses, then a the little section in the middle, and then we'll look at the end, how it ends. But here's how it begins. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. It's really talking about how all believers should remember the gospel. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. This is something we should never forget. Verse 2 says it's by this gospel that we are saved. See, this world will offer its news, 
There's fake news and news advertisements. Uh, the news media just wants to make money off of advertising. And I remember once during the Prop 8 thing in California, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago, and I was involved and this news truck came up and I always was upset that they've never report the other side of the argument of Prop 8. And I asked the, the news reporter that came out of the, the truck there where I was, how come you never do both sides of the issue? And he looked at me like I was crazy and he said, it's a business. In other words, they're just in it for the money. They're not in it for truth. We have popular news and PC correct news and on and on it goes. But God offers his news. Which news report should we look at? We have something called good news it's called the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 says this. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel. That's the good news. I want to remind you of it. The gospel I preached to you, which you have received, on which you have taken your stand. We now have a new stand before God. We should never forget this standing. And it says this in verse 2. By this gospel, we are saved. Now, we have Christmas. Christmas is a great holiday, another great holiday. And it's interesting to, to know that Joseph and Mary didn't even get the name their child that was born. God sent an angel and said, you will call him Yeshua. Yahweh is salvation, Jesus. And what will he save his people from? From their sins. Now the gospel entered this world in a really miraculous way through Jesus at Christmas. And if you remember correctly, the world didn't take too kindly to it. They had to escape Bethlehem with their lives. We have, now we have Easter, and our fallen world doesn't like this one either too much. And holidays have a reason, and really the reason for this holiday is hidden from the world. Unless you bow the knee to the Lord, you'll never find out. And God's true purpose for, for both holidays is earth-shattering. These holidays will shatter the earth, the natural world, you could say. Christmas and Easter are supernatural, so we should never forget the meaning behind them. We have a whole lot of, uh, we have a whole new supernatural standing before God and we stand in Christ. And that is a miracle that God has for us. How can we possibly stand before Christ? Well, God did the impossible. He sent Jesus. We should never forget that. It's, he is a miracle. He sent Jesus to be our Savior. So we have a standing now before him. We should never forget that. Then we get to the next section. Just want to jump in the middle here. Verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. We'll talk about really the position we have. Is there really a resurrection? That's a miracle. And Paul starts out in verse 20 like this. But Christ has indeed been risen from the dead. Some people don't think so, but he really has been risen from the dead. He goes on to say he's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, which is a euphemism for they've died, they've fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. In, I'm going to end with verse 26, a powerful little phrase here. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now in verse 22 it says, For in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. This is reality 101. Death entered God's very good creation. Read about it in Genesis 2. The creation was very good. In Genesis 3, sin entered in. This pattern is still here. In Adam, all die. We are surrounded by death. There is no one, nowhere, that has not inherited death. It's with us. All mankind has inherited it from Adam. So in the gospel, though, we have a new pattern, a completely new pattern. A person must receive Christ to be in this pattern. All who accept Christ will be made alive in him, in Christ. So God offers the world a new inheritance. In fact, Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Nicodemus, you must, it's a must, you must be born again. So we're all born dead to God in Adam. We inherit that. We're just born with it. But now we can be born again with a new inheritance in Jesus Christ. 
Now we can inherit new life. It's not a religion, not something we do. Jesus did it for us. He accomplished it all. No one can earn this new life. We must be born into it, and we must be born again. So what does in mean? In is a, is a preposition, preposition. It talks about a position. It's a relationship connection. You can be in a school, you can be in a marriage, you can be in training. When a person says yes to God's salvation, they're in. They're in Christ, removed from Adam and placed in Christ. Very powerful relationship. So 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22 says, For in Adam all die. Also, so in Christ now, all will be made alive. Now the next verse, verse 23, we get a, a little bit of an explanation of this. It's hard to understand the Bible in, unless we uh, really understand this explanation. We need to, to dig deep into the truth. So verse 23 says this, But in each to his own turn, Christ the firstfruits, then, when he comes, those who belong to him. Now this is speaking of the end of the age right here. Jesus was raised with a brand new, rebuilt, miraculous new body. And he proved it again and again. He, he met with the disciples many times, met with the women at the tomb. He met all different kinds of times, proving that he was alive. So verse 23 then says, when he comes, that's the second coming of Christ. All who belong to him also will receive the same type of body he had. He could walk through walls. He could reappear and appear. He had a new body, a heavenly body, not an earthly body. And we're waiting for the return of Christ so we can have that same body. Then there's another powerful truth revealed in verse 23. It says, Christ the first fruits. Now the Old Testament, if you study the Old Testament with the light of Christ, you can see him everywhere in the Old Testament. Very prophetic portraits of Christ. The, really, the Old Testament is a miracle put in writing thousands of years before Christ even came. God rescued his people out of Egypt. Then he set up a prophetic calendar for them. The simplest explanation is in Exodus 23, starting in verse 14. Just, he said, three times a year, you're to celebrate a festival to me. In other words, meet with me three times a year through that year. So in the springtime, they have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then they wait seven weeks, have the Feast of Harvest, and wait three or four or five months and have, in the fall, have the Feast of Ingathering, three times a year. So Unleavened Bread started with Passover. <clears throat> then on the third day, the day after the Sabbath, would be a Sunday. And then the high priest would wave an offering and just wave it up in the air as, as a prayer. God, bring us a harvest. It's called the first fruits, a promise of a future harvest. So that week was over and then they would wait seven weeks to meet again then. It would be called then the Feast of Harvest. It's also called the Feast of Weeks because it would be seven weeks, 49 days. On the 50th day after Passover then, start the harvest. That's the celebration. And they'd harvest the crops for four or five months and until the trumpet blows. When that trumpet blows, the harvest is over. And then it's time really for the third meeting together in the fall, the Feast of Ingathering. Ingather, gather the, 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 the remainder of the crops, the trumpet blows, marking the end of it, the harvest is over. The people are then gathered together, they meet with God. The high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, behind the curtain puts the blood over the Ark of the Covenant, Yom Kippur, the Day of Covering. Now they're covered for a year. Then we have the, it's a Feast of Tabernacles. God will now tabernacle with his people for another year. And they repeat that cycle every year, three times a year. Probably for 1,500 years they repeated that. How prophetic is it and how powerful it is? It's a miraculous picture of the Messiah Jesus. He is our Passover lamb. It's no accident that Jesus was nailed to a cross on Passover. No accident that on the third day he rose from the grave to be the first fruits of a promised harvest. But it's not a harvest of the fields or crops, but a harvest of human souls. Jesus was raised to life to bring a harvest of humanity from God, lifting people out of this world, saving them. So this is a pattern for all believers. We follow this pattern. So earlier in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul stated how many times Jesus met with people while he was uh, resurrected. He met many times, and we can read the words of Jesus in Acts chapter 1. I want to turn there to Acts chapter 1. 
Luke wrote this, and here's what it says in Acts 1. You could say it's the last words of Jesus before he ascended. So Acts 1 says this, verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them for a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. 40 days he went around with a resurrected body, the same kind of body we will get someday. He's walking around with that body. So verse 4 then says this, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 6. So when they met together, they asked Jesus, Well, Lord, are, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? See, they still don't quite get it because the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet. So Jesus explains it a little deeper in verse 7. It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And that's still going on today. Then in verse 9, as he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. He ascended to heaven now. As they were looking intently up to the sky where he was going, when suddenly two men, two angels dressed in white, stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking to the sky? This same Jesus, who had been taken from you to, into heaven, will come back the same way you have seen him go into heaven. What a beautiful portrait of Jesus. Jesus gave them instructions. Don't leave Jerusalem until the promise of the Father comes. He was thinking about the seven feasts and he's waiting for that feast of harvest. So the feast of Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of first fruits had been fulfilled prophetically by Jesus Christ. He was with them for 40 days and he said, wait for that 50th day. And we have that in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Now, when the day of Pentecost came, Pentecost means the 50th. After seven weeks, 49 days, the 50th day. On the day of Pentecost, I mean, Jerusalem would be filled because that's a feast where everybody should be there. So there's a million, who knows how many people there in Jerusalem. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came in to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So all of a sudden they're born again. You could say the Holy Spirit, all the disciples there. And then Peter gets up filled with the Spirit and begins to teach everybody what is going on. And we can fast forward over to chapter 2 verse 22. He'll say this, because people are wondering what's happening. Why is everybody so excited? Why are they speaking in tongues? And why, why are, is everything changed? Something has happened. He says this in verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miraculous signs and wonders, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. They were witnesses. They saw all this. Verse 23. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross this is all God's plan I don't know if they really understood it but they understand it now verse 24 but God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold upon him I like to think about some things that are impossible for God here's one thing he cannot die Jesus is alive. Now we'll fast forward down to verse 32. So God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of this fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promise, Holy Spirit, and has poured out on you what you now see and hear. This is God's promise, his plan all along, and you're seeing it. For David did not ascend to heaven, yet he said, this is a quote from Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, this is God talking to Jesus, 
The Lord said to my Lord, David said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, this is gospel. This is good news. Israel's not in trouble. God's going to save them. Look what he says now. Look what happens now in verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. It's like they had a circumcision of the heart now. They're ready to believe. So they, say, they yell out to Peter, Peter, what should we do? Oh, that's a beautiful thing to ask. So Peter replies, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name, in the authority of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and from all, this is the entire world, who are far off, and for all whom the Lord will call. And with many other words, Peter warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. We can still say that today, can't we? Now, you got to love this next verse, verse 41. Those who accepted the message, remember, not everyone would, but those who accepted the message were baptized, meaning they're now a believer now, they're willing to be baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number on that day. Wow, there's no accident that the Feast of Harvest began in Acts chapter 2. That was God's plan. But this time it's not a harvest of wheat, not a harvest of corn or crops. It's a harvest of the souls of human beings. They're being harvested out of this earth now. In Acts chapter 2, God's sovereign power said, let the harvest begin according to his Prophetic plan of the three times to meet together. Now the Feast of Harvest has started in Acts 2. And that harvest is still on today. In fact, the Bible says now is the time for salvation. Because one day there'll be no more time. Time's kind of like a miracle that we have. It's, it's by God's grace. If you still have time, then you still have time to say yes to his plan. Well, when will the harvest be over? Well, when that trumpet blows. It's a, it's a signal the harvest is over. And we're still waiting for that trump at the end of the age. So we're still in the harvest time right now. Now if we go back to 1 Corinthians 15 then, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. God's plan of salvation is to rescue as many people as he can who will bow to his plan. They'll be rescued out of Adam and be placed in Christ. Verse 23 says, verse 23 says but to each to his own turn. Christ the firstfruits. This has already happened. He's the first fruits. He has risen. Now we wait. Then when he comes in verse 23, those who belong to him will be raised as well. Some are already in the grave waiting for that new body. Maybe some will get the new body while they're walking on earth, but we're going to get Jesus' body, the same body he had. So all who are in Christ now have that new life. The, the second coming of Christ will all be changed. So we're kind of in the already and in, in the not yet. We've already received it all, but we're still waiting for the new body. So 1 Corinthians 15, 24 then says this, Then the end will come. When Jesus hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Verse 25 says, He must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. Remember, Jesus ascended to heaven. He didn't ascend to heaven just to hang out. He is sitting at the right hand of God, full authority, is given to him. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's sitting on the throne of God, ruling. There will be victory. Verse 26 gives us a clue of the final victory. The last enemy then to be destroyed is death. Now, one of the lies of this world is that death is our friend. Just accept death peacefully and just die peacefully. No, that's a lie. Death entered through a rebellion. Genesis 3, death entered through sin, and death is our enemy. So death will be conquered through new creation. And that new creation is found in Christ. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this, If anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You're a new creation in Christ right now. So one, one day death will be, will be no more and one day time will be no more. In fact, if you look at the book of Revelation, 
apocalypse, it's called, because it turns everything upside down. And look at chapter 21, and we kind of see what happens here. The second to the last chapter in the entire Bible, Revelation 21, verse 1 says this. Then I saw, John had a lot of visions, didn't he? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there's no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. It's like us. We're the believers. We're, good, we're the bride of Christ. There's going to be a, a united union, a holy marriage, you could say, a oneness. Verse 3 then says this, And heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Verse 5 then says this, He who is seated on the throne said this, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these are the words, trustworthy, these trustworthy words are true. This is the truth. He said to me, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty. In other words, if you think you have that need, a thirst for this answer, it's, it's waiting for you. To him who is thirsty, I will give him drink without cost because Jesus paid it all from the spring of the water of life verse 7 he who overcomes will inherit you will inherit it you'll be born into it will inherit this and I will be his God and he will be my son father and son and daughter family now we started out at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, all believers should remember the gospel. We should discipline ourselves and train ourselves to understand the gospel. Then we took a little section out of the middle of 1 Corinthians 15, and all believers now are in Christ. It's our miracle right now on earth. Now I want to look at the, how the resurrection chapter ends. Let's not forget the reason it ends, because first of all, we have a gospel. We are in Christ. And then what happens at the end, all believers should serve the Lord now in victory, in victory. It's very practical. This is not some fantasy story. We can put our faith into practice because Jesus won. Now we go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. In other words, not everybody's going to die. When Jesus comes back, there'll be people living. Not everybody's going to die. And sleep is a euphemism for death. We will all not, not all will sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised up imperishable, and we will all be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable and the mortal with immortality. How else can you describe in words what's going to happen to us? He's trying right here in 1 Corinthians 15. Then it says this in verse 54. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, we'll have our new bodies, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. It's a quote from Isaiah 25. Remember, in, back to verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death is going to be destroyed. Now, if, if you're a winner, then you're going to taunt the loser. And this, here's a taunt right here in verse 55. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? That's a quote from Hosea 13. In other words, God has won and you taunt the loser. Verse 56 says this, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Yes, sin is, is stinging us. It kills us, and the law points to our sin, and it makes us not even want to see the law, but the law points to our sin. That's why it says this, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. However, verse 57, Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. We can't keep the law. Jesus came and kept the law for us. He paid the just price. Now we can just celebrate him and, and not have to pay for it for ourselves. 
Now verse 58 sums it all up. Therefore, after all of this, therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's a winning ending. Verse 58, stand firm, therefore. Now, you ha everybody needs to know why the therefore is therefore. It's there for a reason. Jesus shouted out victory from the cross, didn't he? It is finished. Therefore, we can stand in him. Not our work. It's his work. Our trust is in him. That's a pretty firm standing, isn't it? I'm thankful we don't stand in our own righteousness because we wouldn't last a split second. So it's a firm stand. Then in verse 58 says this, let nothing move you. And there's a lot of moving going on in this world. This, this world just simply cries out constantly, be like us. And they have a media that wants to mediate the truth constantly. And we have a new media, don't we? Jesus, we let him mediate for us now. Then we even have our old nature that bugs us, our, our fallen nature still with us, even though we're born again. We have two natures now, a fallen nature and a new nature. So we have to learn how to deal with our old nature. Our old nature will rebel constantly. Then, of course, there's the adversary, the enemy that is for us. So, so verse 58 is very important. Let nothing move you away from victory. We have it. Then verse 58 says this. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. We can give ourselves to the work of the Lord no matter where we are. You don't have to go to a certain place to do the work. It's at home, it's at school, it's driving the car. It's 24-7. We, we serve him wherever we are, always. But we must serve him, bow to him. Then verse 58 says this, because you know, and this is how it ends. This is a long chapter, it ends this way. You know that your labor in the Lord, you're doing it for him, is not in vain. There will be fruit. We may not see it all the time, we may not feel it, but by faith, we keep moving forward. J just as Jesus won, we now have won in him. We're winners. <clears throat> Everything we do, we do as unto the Lord who has won. I want to finish with one little section in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Kind of very similar to 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> says this. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. All the dead in Christ will rise first. And we're going, well, what's happening? And then it says this in verse 17. After that, we who are still alive and are left to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. So this is an Easter message from the ruler of all creation. God wants everyone to bow and receive. Trust in God, not in self. Trust in God, not the media, not this world's media. Don't let them mediate the truth. Trust in God, not this world. A miracle is waiting for anyone who will bow. And there's a spiritual battle going on for the souls, for this, this harvest. And what it... What it Cost is you must get on your knees and say, Jesus, save me. And you will find immediately that your life will change. So right now we have time. Time will be no more. But now that there's time, it's a time to bow. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this gift you've given us, this gift of new life, that we celebrate Easter and we should always remember what it means and we should always know what we will receive and we should always serve you like servants. Blessed servants, in Jesus' name, let m people be saved that hear this message, Lord. Let them give their lives to you, Lord. Let them get into the word, get into worship, get into prayer, get into a church, and let new life go across this country. Bring a revival across this nation. This nation needs a revival. We ask for that miracle in the name of Jesus. What an Easter service that would be. Amen. God bless you all. Before the throne of God above I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart, I know that why.
Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted Christ my